It is 5.35. I'll begin the program by again saying hello to you and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, it is with heavy hearts we address you in the aftermath of Israel's devastating U.S.-backed genocidal assaults in Gaza. The toll is heart-wrenching, with over 13,000 lives lost, including thousands of innocent children. The somber reality is that the specter of a broader regional conflict hangs over us. As these tragic events unfold, they coincide with ongoing U.S.-Saudi security negotiations, casting a dark shadow of apprehension. The fear lingers that this could pave the way for a potential military support and the unsettling normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Of particular concern is Saudi Arabia's request for uranium enrichment, underscoring the urgency for a serious discussion on its nuclear ambitions. In these grievous times, we stand together in solidarity, grappling with the profound sadness that such widespread suffering and geopolitical uncertainty uh, brings. Today, we convene this distinguished panel, not merely as observers, but as active participants in a critical conversation. Our shared purpose is to illuminate the ongoing crises in the Middle East, and more importantly, to explore tangible strategies that can address the current situation and prevent the escalation of violence. Throughout our discussion, we will have the privilege and the honor of engaging with experts from Palestine, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia, alongside committed peace organizers and activists in the country. Together, we aim to forge a collective understanding and explore actionable steps towards a more peaceful and a just future. So welcome to this vital conversation where knowledge becomes a catalyst for change. Um, it is my absolute privilege and honor to introduce my 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 colleague who's going to open this call with a few words, um, Norman Solomon, who really doesn't need any introduction, but he is the co-founder and national director of Roots Action, a luminary in journalism, media critic, and activism. With roots in anti-war and social justice movements since the 1960s, Norman founded the Institute for Public Accuracy in 1997. An author of a dozen impactful books, including War Made Easy, Solomon's latest release, War Made Invisible, delves into the hidden human toll of American foreign policy. Solomon's influence extends beyond literature. He co-founded Roots Action and has been a force in shaping discourse on government, media, and global affairs. A formidable thinker and activist, Norman Solomon continues to contribute significantly to our understanding of the world. Welcome to my colleague, my mentor. Please take it away. Hanya, thanks so much. And for all that you've done to pull together our virtual gathering here, uh, long nights, early mornings, and also huge thanks to everybody who often on short notice has joined the panel and part of our gathering from around the country and beyond. At Roots Action, like among so many organizations and individuals in the US and elsewhere in the world, we're very mindful that the slaughter now going on in Gaza is supported by the most powerful military, the most powerful government in the world. And perhaps we could say there's a dual responsibility for those of us in the United States to recognize as everyone on the planet paying attention has the potential to do that what's taking place in the Middle East is an ongoing atrocity, that it's been 24-7, 365 for years, indeed decades, but it's gotten worse and worse and notice, noticeably in Palestine for almost two months now. There's also the second facet that if we are in the United States, we have the opportunity, the responsibility, the option, some might say the burden, to exert the kind of pressure that can come from organizing. We know that nothing that is needed will be given from on high, from those in power. Everything that we want to achieve, have achieved, and most importantly, will be achieving in the future, will be because we organize. And as we are committed to nonviolence, we're also committed to truth-telling and militancy and confrontation. 
and the kind of protest that we've seen in the last few weeks around this country against the genocidal actions and policies of Israel supported by the United States, we need many more of those and in many more types of facets and manifestations. So just in closing, I want to say that as our group, our team prepared for this event tonight, this Teach In for Action, we've been very mindful of really two overarching responsibilities and hopes and goals for the next hour or so. One is the sharing of vital information that we're not getting from the U.S. mass media and that often is obscured or even lied about by the U.S. mass media. So information sharing, really crucial. And the other equally crucial aspect is the activism, the organizing, the strategizing. And so for everybody on our call here tonight, I hope that you'll keep in mind that no one can do everything, but everybody can do something. And we're here tonight to figure out how from all over this country and beyond, we can work together for the changes that are vital. Thank you so much, Norman, and and uh, to and thank you for all the work that you do to lead us uh, during these these dark times. Um, I do want to echo with uh, what Norman uh, just mentioned that a, a big part of this uh, call is going to be dedicated to a discussion about the Middle East and the ongoing crises in Gaza, um, and another part of it is going to be about engagement and and uh, uh, coming together as a coalition to push back which is something that has happened in the past month so beautifully. Um, our next speaker, who is a dear friend, a mentor of mine, is Dr. Joman, Dr. Aisha Joman, who is the president of Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. She is a seasonal public health expert with over 30 years of experience specializing in viral vaccine preventable diseases, cancer research, and maternal and child health. Currently an independent consultant, she coordinates health projects in Yemen. She's a former CDC leader and she directed the HPV vaccines evidence for impact project at PATH. Her extensive career spans academia, international organizations and research projects, showcasing her dedication to global health initiatives. Unfortunately, Dr. Joman was not able to join us tonight live, but she is going to, she pr provided a video. Uh, and in the video, she'll take us through the role that the US has played in the war in Yemen. So I will have my colleague Ryan Black play the video. I do want to warn that sh the sound may be a bit low. So I do ask that you turn up your volumes a bit and then turn it back down once we move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, my name is Aisha Jaman. Thank you for inviting me uh, to speak today. I'll be speaking about the US role in the Middle East wars and I'm gonna be focusing mainly on Yemen. I'd like to start with a map of Yemen just to show you where Yemen sits and how the strategic importance in terms of the geography of Yemen because it controls the Strait of Bab el Mandeb where a lot of oil and merchandise uh, pass through. Unfortunately, the war on Yemen, the Saudi-led war on Yemen was supported by the US and it was actually announced from Washington DC, not from Saudi Arabia. Here is a CBS News and it says, in a mutual tableau, Saudi Arabia ambassadors to the United States announced the rare military operations by his country at the Washington News conference about half an hour after the bombing began. So it wasn't announced from Riyadh, but unfortunately was an announced here from the US in Washington DC. And many people in Yemen view this as an American war as well. It was uh, Obama's war of choice supporting the Saudi led air war in Yemen. Uh, President Obama has authorized provision of logistical and intelligence support to the GCC countries uh, led military operation. Uh, that was unfortunate because the Yemeni people suffered quite a bit as a result of that decision by Obama. And we are now on the third president uh, from Obama to, <clears throat> to Trump to Biden. All of them have supported the Saudi led war on Yemen. 
Yemen is the graveyard of the Obama doctrine. Um, Obama had said that he wanted less wars and more negotiations and peace, but unfortunately that was not true when he authorized the war against Yemen and supported the Saudis on it. This is uh, an article by Obama aides, uh, Robert Malley and Stephen Bomber, and basically saying accomplice to carnage how American, uh, America enables war in Yemen. It was unfortunate when the decision to wage war in Yemen by the Saudis was presented to the US administration to Obama. That wasn't even discussed. They just gave them um, the right to go ahead and do that which is quite heartbreaking um, to consider that they didn't even discuss why they needed to support the Saudi-led war on Yemen. Saudi Arabia, of course, buy most the, the most weapons from the U.S. government. Uh, it's the number one purchasers of weapons from the U.S. government. If you look at this slide, you see that in 2011 to 2015, 32% 30 30, of all weapons that were exported from the U.S. went to Saudi Arabia and then uh, in 2016 to 2020, 37 percent, almost 40 percent of all weapons sold went to uh, Saudi Arabia. We also know that a lot of these weapons were used to kill uh, Yemeni citizens uh, and civilians. This is an, an article by the Washington Post that says more than 60 killed, including children in an airstrike in Yemen. This is from MSF saying unjustifiable Saudi-led coalition airstrikes kills at least 82 people and injures hundreds. This is in January 2022. Over 100 dead or wounded in Yemen airstrikes, ICRC says. Bombing of schools by Saudi-led coalition is a flagrant attack on the future of Yemeni children. This is from Amnesty International. Again, MSF says three years after a Abs hospital bombing, airstrikes continue to hit civilians. Saudi Arabia hit multiple hospitals in Yemen, although they knew the coordinates of those hospitals. They still purposefully um, targeted those hospitals. Yemen Saudi led funeral attack, apparent war crime. This was a funeral uh, in Sana'a in which the Saudi didn't just hit once, they actually did a double strike, meaning they hit the first time and when the first respondent came to help, they hit again. Over 100 people died in that airstrike. U.S. allies have killed thousands of Yemeni civilians from the air after 22 died at a wedding. One village asked, why us? There were actually multiple weddings that were targeted by the Saudi-led coalition. Saudi Arabia deliberately targeting impoverished Yemen farms and agriculture industry in addition to the blockade preventing essential goods including food and fuel from coming into Yemen, they also targeted uh, the food sources within Yemen as well. So their airstrikes in Yemen had facilities providing water to hundreds of thousands facing, facing cholera outbreak. Uh, Yemen had the largest reported cholera outbreak in the world with over 2.3 million suspected cases. U.S. supplied bombs that killed 40 children on Yemen school bus. These were kids who were on a, a school trip. Um, and the airstrike, again, this was another uh, double airstrike where um, at least uh, 40 kids, many of them were less than 10 years of age, were killed. Yemen U.S. made bomb kills and maims children in deadly strike on residential homes. The majority of airstrikes were on residential homes in Yemen, with tens of thousands of homes destroyed. Yemen war would have killed almost 400,000 by year end. This was in 2021. I can assure you that the number is a lot larger than that because we don't count, we don't have death registries in Yemen and in many people who die at home would never be registered. 
Biden's broken promise in Yemen. Biden, when he came to power, he said that he was going to end the war in Yemen and uh, stop supporting the Saudi-led war in Yemen. And he even said he was going to make Mohammed bin Salman a pariah. That unfortunately didn't happen. And Saudi gets first major arms deal under Biden with air-to-air -air missiles. We I'll mention here a bit about the arms industry. Uh, this is an article about how Riathon CEO sees solid growth in the Middle East, uh, saying peace not coming, going to break out anytime soon. This is after uh, Biden said that he was going to end the war in Yemen. Uh, the CEO of Riathon was very optimistic, and as we can see in Gaza now, um, that it actually uh, is very true that the wars in, in the Middle East that are enabled by the U.S. continue to happen. Here's another one. Uh, similarly, Lockheed Martin CEO Jim Tassler expressed foreign arms sales to remain a, a, pro a priority in the Biden administration. So they didn't believe him, while we did, unfortunately. He said, I don't think that we'll have a more uh, open environment for foreign military sales and direct commercial sales to our international partners. If you need to know more about the Saudi-led war in Yemen, frequently uh, asked questions, FCNL has a great resource. Um, as advocates and as grassroots advocates, I would ask that all of us support um, and into all the wars in Yemen. What is going on in Gaza is heartbreaking, is actually heart shattering. And we need to press the US government to stop selling arms, transferring arms to uh, the, the people who are killing civilians, whether it's in, in Yemen or whether it's uh, in Gaza. Thank you very much. It is always a pleasure and a delight to hear from Dr. Aisha Jomman, um, and I am more than happy to ask if she is willing and open to share the slides with our attendees and audience members. I do want to ask that you please do post your questions in the chat. We will see them. Unfortunately, we may not be able to get through all of them because of time and the number of speakers this evening, but um, I'm more than happy to look through and, and, and pick a few to ask if need be. Uh, all right, so I will go to our next speaker, uh, Mitchell Plitnik, who is a dynamic force and the president of Rethinking Foreign Policy, weaving narratives that res resonate across the Middle East and US foreign policy landscapes. Former vice president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace and the director of the US office of Bet Salam, um, Mitchell is also a co-director of Jewish Voice for Peace. Collaborating right. with Mark Lamont Hill, he co-authored the impactful Except for Palestine, the new press. Mitchell uh, embodies the fusion of intellect and activism, crafting compelling legacy that inspires change on a global uh, stage. Uh, Mitchell, um, when we spoke earlier, we talked about a few um, options and and, 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 and and a few questions that I, I, I do want to ask you going into your speech. Um, what are the actual prospects for justice for Palestine at this point? Is there going to be any justice for the Palestinian liberation with the Western government working around the clock against this very thing? And, and having seen what we just saw and witnessed with Dr. Joman talking about the catastrophes um, in, in Yemen, what steps do we take at this moment to hold Israel accountable after a ceasefire, if there's a long lasting one? Um, and what should our demand be uh, as activists and organizers? Take it away, please. So uh, thank you, first of all, for that for that very lovely introduction. Um, I'm flattered. Um, and thanks to everyone for, for being here. Um, you know, I think that the the question of accountability is obviously a very difficult one. We don't really have global, um, you know, systems of accountability. What we do have um, is a uh, is the response of global civil society, and we're seeing that happen now. We're seeing uh, people out in the street all over the world, and and certainly in the United States, and. Uh, it, it's moved opinion. There have already been a number of countries that have closed their embassies in Israel uh, over what Israel is doing in Gaza. Uh, and I think that's important. 
ultimately, I think um, the United States is going to have to change its policy before there's going to be uh, a, a, any sort of justice and and way forward uh, for Palestine. Um, and I think what we're seeing now with Gaza is a pretty grim marker uh, about where that goes. We are talking here about, you know, a a, uh, a Democratic president who ha- who through his entire administration from day one uh, tried to bury the issue of Palestine. He tried to ignore it. He tried to pretend that there that that he could go about business as usual without addressing uh, Palestinian rights at all. And it has blown up in everyone's face uh and everyone is now suffering for that um that being said uh he has done this uh in many ways i think on his own personal conviction we've seen an astounding actually amount of resistance to u.s policy from within the u.s government from from the staff at the white house and state department people have been registering their disapproval uh, of U.S. policy, which is highly unusual. Um, I mean, people discuss and disagree, but but for it to reach the public in the way it has is very, very unusual. Um, I think the most important uh, aspect that's pushed Biden uh, to at least start to try and restrain Israel from its, its genocidal, frankly, assault on Gaza uh, has been the number of people we've seen in the street. Uh, you know, at Jewish Voice for Peace, which just to say, I, I used to be the co-director. Now I'm on the board of directors there. Um, you know, at Jewish Voice for Peace, we are working very closely with allies, and I think uh, for you know, we have we have demonstrated at the White House. We closed down Grand Central Station in New York. Um, there have been other demonstrations that we have held all across the country, and we're working, I think, most powerfully together with our Muslim our Muslim brothers and sisters. And that I think is a powerful force that is uh, that is potent uh, and pushes politicians to get nervous. And I think we have to remember Joe Biden, for whatever else he may be, is a consummate politician. Uh, and I think one of the things that has pushed him is because his staff is, is constantly telling him, uh, dude, you're 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 losing key votes in battleground states uh, for next year. There are a lot of people, and, and I have to say, I count myself among them, who would find it very, very difficult to vote next year for, for Joe Biden. Luckily, I live in Maryland. It's not an issue. Whether I vote for Biden or not, it's going to go, it's, my state's going to go for him. There's a lot of states, particularly Michigan, I, I can think of right away, that that's not true of. Um, and he needs to look at that if he, just, just on a pure political level. Um, and so I think that is important. But long term, um, I think the most important factor is that we can no longer, uh, as Americans, sit back and allow our foreign policy to be dictated by politics, to be dictated by uh, you know cold, calculated uh, interests. There has to be a rights-based approach, not only because it's the right thing to do, which I think is obvious, um, but also because it's the only way to resolve the problems that we're facing. We, you know, Biden and and the rest of his administration are now talking about a future of a two state solution again. Um, whether one thinks that's possible, preferable or not, the approach of basing the solution has clearly basing the solution on some sort of a specific framework has failed and it has failed for many reasons, but one of the big ones is that that framework is almost completely divorced from rights. If we are not, if we are not basing our approach on a on, on a vision of the future where every Palestinian and every Israeli has the same human rights as every American, as every European, um, as and all of those rights are expressed equally and fairly and with justice. Um, I, I I think we've proven if we're not going to solve this problem and we're going to have more uh, more months like the, the the two we have just experienced. Thank you so much, Mitchell, for for your perspective. I think one of the things that you mentioned on on in, in your speech just now is the lack of desire for the younger generation and uh, you know Democrats in certain swing states to vote for Joe Biden. So. Um, we are we may be in trouble for 2024. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so um I thank you for your remarks. And 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 I think this is an incredible way to kind of 
go into um, uh, introducing our next speaker, um, who I am so honored to call my friend that I'm, Hawaii, I'm holding you close right now, even though I'm far from you. Um, Renowned for championing civil and human rights, our distinguished speaker, Hawaida Araf, is not merely an attorney, but a passionate Palestinian-American activist. As a co-founder of the International Solidarity Movement, her dedication to fostering global unity has left an incredible mark beyond legal practice. Uh, uh, left an incredible mark. Beyond legal practice, she ventured into the realm of politics fearlessly running as a candidate for U.S. Congress in Michigan's 10th Congressional District, Hawaida's journey is a testament to the enduring spirit of advocacy and the pursuit of justice that defines her inspiring career. Um, Hawaida, uh, again, I am standing in solidarity. I think I, I told you this before on a call. Um, we're all Palestinian um, in this moment today. Uh, and so um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit and, and have you perhaps paint a picture of what's happening in Gaza right now that is not visible to our eyes, right? Um, and, and there's another part to my question and, and I would love for you to address is given the rise of solidarity with the Palestinian freedom, I wanna hear about your thoughts and perspective on the conflation of anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism and how should we as activists push back against this, right? Um, take the floor, please. Great. Thank you so much, Tanya. I'm honored to call you a sister and a friend. Thank you to Roots Action and for everyone um, behind the scenes involved in putting this together. I'm honored to be with this esteemed panel. Uh, and I do apologize for my mask, but I had a, a oral surgery which left my face swollen, so I thought it would be less distracting if I covered up. Uh, what's happening in Gaza, I think it's beyond anyone's ability to kind of comprehend the level of, of devastation. We know we hear about the numbers killed, which we don't even know exact numbers, right? We hear about 15,000 of the ones that were able to be counted, 70% of those women and children, but there are still thousands, approximately 7,000 still buried under the rubble. And the a couple of days ago, the World Health Organization warned that the spread of disease will likely kill more people in Gaza than the bombing has. Uh, because uh, even before Israel started this uh, horrendous bombing campaign, the, the, the situation of Gaza was already dire. It was back in, I believe, 2012 that the United Nations said that by 2020, Gaza would be unlivable because of the lack of potable water. It is it completely kind of barricaded on all sides. Israel controls what goes in and out, and it is most, one of the most densely populated places in the world. Uh, and on top of that, since Israel completely sealed off Gaza, uh, beginning in 2008 with a, a, a vicious onslaught bombing campaign. And since then, at least five major onslaughts against Gaza, causing major destruction, not only to homes and property and the killing of thousands of civilians and the maiming of so many others, but the destruction of, of the already weak infrastructure. So even before October 7th, for example, uh, about a hundred, an estimated 110 million liters of untreated or partially treated sewage was being dumped into the Mediterranean Sea every day because Israel wouldn't allow in the supplies that Palestinians needed to fix their uh, sewage system. And in that polluted water is where um, Gaza's fishers had to fish because Israel limits how far out Palestinian fishers can go in order to fish and they're limited generally to about three nautical miles before the Israeli Navy starts shooting at them. And so there has long been kind of this warning of the outbreak of waterborne diseases. And now with what we've seen, almost an approximate 50% of the living structures destroyed. I mentioned the high number of casualties, but there's also been report of, of looting. So people even going back to their homes right now just to look for what they might be able to salvage are finding things uh, missing that, that there has been no income, no one's been able to work. And so even though there has been this quote unquote humanitarian pause, it is very difficult for people to get by and they are almost entirely dependent on the very little aid that's coming in. You know, there's talk about that there has been an increase uh, to about 200 
eight trucks per day since the pause. But before October 7th, there was approximately 500 trucks of aid coming in. And so that was just to meet the basic needs of the people in Gaza before October 7th. And so after October 7th, with all of the destruction and then the immense need that we see right now, only about 200 trucks a day. And that's only since the pause, it was much less before that. So it is very, very dire. And this is not even taken into consideration just the trauma of kind of going back to your home, a destroyed home, but so many of them are, are not only rubble, but people still have family members under that rubble. Um, children that are massively traumatized. I saw a video of the other day of a child just wishing that she had died with her mother. She said it would be better if I had just died with my mother. Um, it, trauma that, of course, no one should be subjected to, but just that, that will involve, in addition to humanitarian aid, just an influx of, of social workers and others to be able to address this generation that has been traumatized. And I haven't even talked about, you know, the injuries, the serious injuries, the um, amputees, people that have even doctors that have had to operate on their own children without anesthesia, doctors that have had to amputate without anesthesia. Um, you have approximately 50,000 women that are pregnant and that are facing having to give birth without water, uh, without anesthesia for C-sections. It is just catastrophic. That is is Gaza today, and that is just a, you know I haven't even touched on that's barely touching the surface. So what we need to keep up the pressure in terms of this can't be just a temporary pause; it has to be a permanent ceasefire. And Gaza needs to be opened. There needs to be an influx of not only humanitarian aid but all kinds of medical workers and others to help this society begin to recover. Uh, because again, it was uh, a traumatized society even before October 7th. But what we're seeing now, you know, in these talks, and Mitchell touched on it uh, a bit, is this talk about the two-state solution. And it is a, a, a failed start. What, what people are failing to kind of recognize is they're talking about, as Mitchell said, these kind of uh, this political paradigm that not only has failed for the last, like, 30 plus years, but also doesn't take into consideration the root cause of the problem. This is not a conflict between two sides. This is uh, a settler colonial project. And this latest Israeli onslaught is was a genocidal campaign that is furthering the settler colonial goals of, of really getting rid of the indigenous Palestinian population. And it's been done under the cover of, uh, you know, the pretext of going after Hamas. Uh, which is just ludicrous on many levels. I don't know if we have uh, time to touch on it, but trying to uh, impose the or, or thinking that you're, there's some military solution that is just going to wipe out Hamas and then then there's going to be left some population that is going to suddenly be ready for peace is is ridiculous. Even for the United States, let's say Israel, that's a part of its plan. It just wants to get rid of people under a pretext that it can say Hamas and it could say terror. But for the United States to actively support that when the United States has its own experience, you know, in Iraq and in Afghanistan of this kind of failed uh, policy that results in even more extremism after you inflict such massive horrors on, on civilians, it is inexcusable for the United States to to support, but that's you know what we have. So to to wrap up and address the last part of your question, I think people as much as possible need to keep up the campaign. We are starting to see kind of a change in the U U.S. specifically rhetoric and how they're talking about this, and I think that there that's a result of the massive pressure that has been put on the administration, but also kind of globally. Uh, we need to keep that up. There needs to be a permanent ceasefire and there needs to be a realization that Palestinian people themselves have agency. Don't sit and talk about others from outside who are going to determine what Gaza is going to look like or who is going to rule Gaza. We have to start with what the root cause of the, the problem is and how to how to address that, how to stop enabling and stop supporting, stop funding settler colonialism and start to dismantle colonialism so that we can build a future uh, and whatever structure, a you know political 
uh, structure it, 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 there is in the future, whether it be two states or one state or 10 states, it is, you know, systems that represent all people equally, as, as Mitchell said. Uh, and as we do that, you know, as we are trying to point out the hypocrisy in the U.S., uh, policy and calling what Israel is doing what it is, a genocidal campaign that meets the, the legal definition of, of genocide, uh, we are being called anti-Semites and uh, Jew haters and everything else. And this is not new, but of course, it's being ramped up right now. And we're seeing a lot of uh, people really uh, being suffering repercussions. So many people are losing their jobs or being reprimanded at school or being uh, silenced in in different ways, um, which is unfortunate, but I think that there's also a realization that we have to fight back because if we let that th this tactic of silencing work against us, then then we're letting uh, violence and, and militarism uh, win, and we're not going to do that. And so there is a legal organization in the United States, Palestine Legal. It's a very small organization, but it has been uh, representing people and hundreds of lawyers, myself included, around the around the United States have volunteered to just offer whatever we can support the Palestine legal so that nobody who is facing backlash uh, for advocating for Palestinian rights feels alone or unrepresented. And of course, just what we have been saying for a long time, it's not new. The conflation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism is really uh, unfortunate. And all of us who are in this struggle are opposed to all kinds of, of racism and discrimination. And so I very much see the struggle against um, anti-Semitism as being a, a struggle that I also embody. It is my own because it is part of the uh, our larger struggle. Oh, thanks. Sorry, that was my son just coming home. Um, and the, thank you. And um, it does a great service, a uh, disservice, sorry, to the real struggle against anti-Semitism, which uh, the uh, Palestine liberation movement uh, adopts as its own. We don't want to see any kind of discrimination or racism. That is a fight that is all of ours uh, and certainly one of the Palestine liberation movement. Thank you so much, Hobaida. Um, this is a this is a, a question that was posted in the chat, and if if one of you, Hobaida or Mitchell, can address this, that'd be that'd be great. Before we move on to our next speaker, is there a chance that some nations or a group of nations might be bring a case uh, of genocide against Israel in the International Court of Justice? Um, apparently, this idea has been circulated um, in a couple of articles and and some Twitter posts that we've seen, and some countries are now starting to. You know, really uh, take up action against you know what's happening to to the to the Palestinians and innocent uh, children and, and and men and women. Um, is there could could one of you address this uh, briefly, please? Um, I'm happy to, unless you want to, Mitchell. Or please go ahead. Well, so it, yes, we know the problems with the International uh, Criminal Court, and, and there's a lot of politics involved there, although there have been a number of uh, cases filed with the International Criminal Court, but the criminal International Criminal Court has also been investigating cases of Israeli war crimes for the last few years and has not moved on anything yet. So there is this idea of one state, you know, that is signatory to the Genocide Convention, invoking the Genocide Convention at the International Court of Justice, which is less politicized. Uh, and, you, you know, we hear that possibly some states are considering it. I don't have any concrete information. But what I can say is I believe the, uh, actually, the state of Palestine can also invoke it. And, you know, there's a question as to why they aren't actually invoking the Genocide Convention. But, uh, it, it is certainly something that people are advocating for, certainly from the states that have taken uh, political steps, whether it's expelling the ambassador uh, or, or cutting off relations with Israel. We are hopeful that one of them will. Uh, I am also hopeful that the state of Palestine will step up and invoke the genocide convention. Certainly. And did you, Mitchell, want to add to this as well? Um, I, I don't have I don't have much to say other than um, you know I, I since Israel isn't a party to any you know any international legal structures there's always a limit to to how much you can do there and I think you know the there's many many parts and if we're just 
thinking long term I and mean, not not you know this really doesn't bear on on the on, on the emergency situation we're in now but thinking long term i think this entire you know the the israel palestine question for 100 years now has shown us the need for a really radically different approach to international law and and uh, the desperate need to to set up a legal system that's not set up by a lot of you know uh, major world leaders and and generals and and people like that which is the people who basically set this up the system that we have now um and and we need to find one where which not only has proper principles and and a, and and a a rights based approach at its heart, but also has teeth. And we need to, without that, I think we're just going to continue to see, uh, you know, the powerful uh, stepping on the 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 necks of the powerless. Thank you so much, Mitchell. And I wish I could get to all of your questions in the chat, but we'll pick some as as, as we go. I do want to bring in my colleague, uh, Ryan Black, who will share with us what the call to action would be for this evening before we move to Saudi Arabia's request for uranium and um, its normalization with Israel. Um, so a relationship or normalization with Israel. So Ryan, take it away, please. Thank you, Hanya. I will be pretty brief. Uh, there are a ton of places to find online actions, but at Diffuse Nuclear War, we really focus on activism that is on the ground in our communities with our friends and neighbors and colleagues. We are organizing our next week of action, the first of 2024 for Diffuse Nuclear War, January 8th to 14th, 2024. So let's make a New Year's resolution to be in the streets demanding peace and to work together to reduce the risks of nuclear war. If you have any interest in organizing on the ground in your own congressional district around these issues of peace and war and nuclear weapons, especially in how it relates to the Middle East, like we're talking about tonight, uh, please fill out this super easy one question form that I linked in the chat. Uh, and just let us know that you're interested and we will uh, reach out to you and, and, and get things going. In the past, we've had individuals and organizations do pickets, protests, demonstrations, Vigils, marches, banner drops, they've met with members of Congress, which we highly recommend, especially around this issue, and plenty of other things I can't think of right now, all of which uh, we want to help you do too, if you haven't already. Uh, so again, if you want to take action with us, with your community, January 8th to 14th, please fill out the form in the chat now. And then feel free to share that form with members of organizations you're in, or that you lead, or you're friends or uh, uh, other community activists. And uh, we look forward to getting into contact with you and getting something organized. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ryan. And and uh, right after this call, we'll do a follow-up email with uh, our attendees with all of this information, including Dr. Aisha Joman's slides uh, for you all to have access to. Um, let's take a, a, a trip over now to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, um, I, it's an honor to introduce our next speaker who I've been looking for, uh, uh, you know, to, to secure him for this call as a panelist, uh, Abdullah al Auda, who is the Saudi Director for the Freedom Initiative, is a distinguished academic, advocate, and a political leader. Formerly a visiting adjunct professor at George Washington University and a senior fellow at Georgetown University, um, Abdullah brings extensive expertise before his role at the Freedom Initiative, he served as the director for the Gulf and Democracy for the Arab World uh, Now, founded by Jamal Khashoggi. Abdul, uh, Abdullah is also a secretary general of the National Assembly Party, Saudi Arabia's first openly declared political party. He played a crucial role in drafting the Saudi people's vision for reform, advocating for democracy and human rights in Saudi Arabia. He is a fantastic writer and a commentator, and he works on Saudi and the Persian Gulf uh, uh, and a number of other things. You can find his work as soon as you YouTube, it, uh, you Google his first name and last name. And it's a delight to have you here with us, um, Abdullah. I wanted to kind of briefly ask you uh, to talk to us briefly about whether or not the Israeli normalization deal is now dead upon arrival. And how has the Israel war in Gaza impact the Iran-Saudi relationship uh, in the um, uh, and the events in in Yemen? If you could, if you could talk about that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, first of all, for having me today. I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, honored uh, 
to be among these uh, colleagues and uh, great speakers. Um, well, for, first of all, I want to I want to um, you know highlight the uh, point that uh, I remember when we criticized the normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Uh, we hear voices um, in DC that said, uh, for example, to us, "Why you are against peace?" You know, and then uh, a few weeks later, uh, those same voices um, are actually now opposing the ceasefire in Gaza. And I was like, oh, okay, so um, the normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel that will commit the U.S. administration to arm in Saudi Arabia, spilling uh, bloods to protect the dictatorship in Riyadh, um, and helping a uh, nuclear uh, program uh, in Saudi Arabia is a peace deal somehow, but uh, the ceasefire in Gaza is not. So that's that's part of the hypocrisy you, you hear sometimes in some of the think tanks and some of the voices uh, here in, in D.C. So uh, this is just one, one point. And uh, I was, uh, you know, part of the... Uh, as you, I don't know if, if uh, some of you like followed the um, negotiations between the admin and Saudi Arabia to uh, push for the deal, and they were actually uh, 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 requirements by the Saudi government, and I guess two major um, uh, asks by the government by the Saudi government was uh, were actually one is. A security pact that will commit the U.S. Uh, army uh, to uh, protect Saudi Arabia um, uh, in in a more like a NATO kind of uh, agreement. Uh, uh, that's one. The second thing is uh, help with the nuclear uh, program, and it was uh, it was actually appalled by appalled by how. Uh, not just Republican like Lindsey Graham, who went to Riyadh and uh, uh, you know uh, praised uh, the kingdom for its reforms, and uh, Mohammed bin Salman as a reformer, uh, but actually people uh, from the Democratic Party, uh, including uh, uh, advisors to the Biden administration like um, uh, Jake Sullivan and. Uh, uh, what's his name? The Amos, uh, um, uh, who who actually said something similar about like um, negotiating with Saudi Arabia to uh, provide some help uh, around um, the nuclear program. So we are talking about like a nuclear program for uh, Saudi Arabia that actually said in multiple times that is going to uh, bring war to Iran, that is going to, uh, uh, you know, use this, uh, you know, um, uh, a nuclear help, uh, help to build an, uh, like an, an unpeaceful uh, nuclear uh, program. So I'm not sure how is this in any way uh, a peace deal uh, or a peace, uh, uh, you know, uh, agreement um, or helping to make peace in the Middle East at all. Uh, the other point I want to make here is like, uh, because the also normalization is not popular at all uh, among Saudis, um, and because the uh, normalization uh, is not going to, uh, I think, be sustainable because if the Saudi government uh, is doing this um, against the will of the Saudi people, and uh, with this uh, very an ultra extremist uh, government uh, in Tel Aviv uh, that is waging this bloody war in Gaza, uh, I'm not sure how this is going to be uh, a peace deal. Uh, to your question, how I think the deal or, or the, the normalization is going to be after the war uh, in Gaza right now, well, uh, Jared Kushner went to Riyadh uh, during the first week of the war uh, for the FII um, forum. And he basically said uh, the signals from Riyadh is like they are still interested in normalization, uh, despite all the language they hear from Riyadh, but like um, 
their uh, opposition to the war in Gaza uh, and all that. Uh, we also heard in the past few days from the admin, uh, high officials spoke to multiple journalists um, uh, about uh, the Saudis uh, signaling again that they are still interested in normalization with Israel, despite everything happening in Gaza uh, and in, in the Middle East. Uh, so I think this is a very horrible um, pathway uh, for the admin, instead of thinking for ceasefire in Gaza, uh, working to uh, protect uh, children, uh, you know, in Palestine, working to just normalize between Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel to protect uh, the dictatorship in Riyadh, not to protect the people, by the way. I'm a Saudi. I, I care about the Saudi people. So this is in no way protecting the Saudi people at all. Uh, I don't think uh, supporting, for example, the Yemen war was in any way uh, protecting the Saudi people. It was basically uh, uh, providing uh, weapons uh, and uh, help and intelligence uh, to the dictatorship in Riyadh to spill bloods uh, of Yemenis and Saudis uh, uh, together. I, I don't want to take much of your time, but I, I want to stop here and, and say that um, the normal, the, the future of the normalization uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel um, is still, uh, you know, uh, up for discussion between the two countries. And I think it's still negotiated, still being negotiated. Um, but it's not as uh, imminent as a lot of people thought before uh, October seventh. Uh, a lot of people, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, thought that. And by the way, I hear a lot from the admin and, very, and pe people close to the admin uh, in Congress saying that oh, all all of October seventh happened because they want to stop this normalization between Saudi Arabia and Riyadh. Like if this whole crisis between the you know. This, like the 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 uh, settlements, the you know uh, the colonization, the you know the occupation happened. Like if it the whole story started uh, on October seventh, uh, not not way before that when the occupation uh, first started. Uh, I want to stop here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Abdullah, for sharing your expertise um, in, uh, in the region. Um, that kind of brings our next speaker. And, and I, I want to hear your perspective, Emma Claire Foley, about what does a Saudi um, with nukes look like for that region, right? Uh, but I do want to introduce you to our audience members. I am honored to call you my colleague and work with you on a day-to-day -day basis. Emma Claire Foley is a nuclear weapon policy expert, writer, filmmaker who has spent her career working for nuclear disarmament campaigns. Her commentary has been featured in Newsweek, NBC, The Guardian, and other international news outlets. She's also active in healthcare organizing through the Demo Democratic Socialist of America. Again, it has been an absolute pleasure to learn from you uh, in the past few weeks. Um, but I do want to focus again on uh, Saudi's request for uranium enrichment and what does that look like for the region um, if, if if they do in fact uh, have, have nukes? Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Hanya. The feeling is definitely mutual. Um, and yeah, I, I think um, we've already heard quite a bit of kind of the basics of this issue. Um, Sorry, I'm having it's such a mix of emotions right now. You know, being on this foreign policy panel while while just having received the news that Henry Kissinger has died, um, and I'm thinking like, is there a way to sort of integrate his uh, influence on this into this talk? But I'm going to stick to my uh, script anyway. Um, that yeah, so we've had the basic outlines of uh, the the issue here already. That. Um, the U.S. Saudi security deal would come with an obligation uh, on both part, ostensibly, but um, in practice, you know, the U.S. is probably more likely to actually um, commit resources militarily to uh, a conflict in the name of Saudi Arabia. Should this kind of deal be passed, um, that would commit the U.S. to to uh, this kind of um, 
closer relationship with Saudi Arabia. You hear a slip in um, the administration and other uh, high officials uh, discussions of um, Saudi Arabia where they often refer to the country as an ally or as an, as an ally sort of casually where uh, while the situation is, you know, there's not an agreement that makes that true. Um, but it kind of betrays like uh, the extent to which it's become like a, a commonplace for the U.S. to consider Saudi Arabia kind of a um, an anchor for its policy in the Middle East, uh, especially with respect to Iran. Um, so looking specifically at the uranium enrichment deal, looking at the possibility of a Saudi nuke uh, and the, the sort of changing what the nuclear politics of the region might look like uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, first of all, uh, you know, ostensibly this is a deal to support a nuclear power program, um, which is interesting when you take a look at you know, Saudi's role as a uh, as a major oil state um, and its reputation as such. Um, the nuclear power deal is kind of uh, is connected to you know some messaging or thinking on uh, climate change and uh, shifting a strategy going forward. Even as we understand from the sort of broader picture of of the news that um, the continuation of of its role as a as a pro major producer of oil is very much part of its plan going forward for uh, foreign policy and for kind of the relationships it's establishing through the world. Um, so, but, you know, we have this evidence from uh, multiple interviews uh, that uh, Mohammed bin Salman has given to the U.S. press uh, where he states that the that the that Saudi Arabia would develop a nuclear weapon should Iran uh, do the same, um, and so I'm not exactly I'm not suggesting a particular pathway by which um, it might develop a nuclear weapon or a a military nuclear program. Nor is he, of course, but uh, there is a confidence there that that's a capability available to them and a capability that they would pursue. Uh, in response to a state of affairs which um, has, you know, there's a large segment of the U.S. sort of political class that's been arguing that an, an, an Iranian nuke is a foregone conclusion, right? Um, and so this to me is a, a matter of immediate or almost immediate concern as a, a situation that may develop. Uh, what this might what this means to me, a couple thoughts about uh, how it might, how I think it might shift the balance of power and how I think it sort of betrays certain things about the U.S.'s foreign policy strategy. Um, there's, a, you know, when you look at the possibility of the U.S. providing this uranium enrichment deal, um, you have to sort of look at it with this constant framing you hear from the administration about competition with China. Um, the fact that China has already put in a bid for a, a nuclear power uh, facility uh, to build one in Saudi Arabia. Um, and, uh, you know, all, this is always kind of brought up with a sense of inevitability, right, that this will happen no matter what. Um, but, you know, in the event that the U.S. is um, the country which prov which provides this, which sort of facilitates this, um, I think that there's a there's a sense in which not only is it not um, adhering to its its obligations under the nonproliferation treaty, which uh, of pursuing disarmament, but also kind of taking a more and more lax approach, right, or even a sort of permissive approach to um, who is able to have a nuclear weapon. I always think back to a clip I found of President Biden a few months before he was elected where he kind of offhandedly says, um, well, you know, if if South Korea gets a nuke, like it could happen. It's it's he just says it as if it as if it may happen and he's kind of resigned to it. And as if it's not, you know, it's not a red line. And that's always kind of haunted me, especially when I hear people talk about the deal with Saudi Arabia as like, you know, it's not it's not NATO. It's it's more like what the US has with, with South Korea. And so it's always kind of rolling through my head that way, right? So so using 
uh, nuclear weapons as a kind of as a, again a way of like picking you know fav- picking favorites this is a is a bit of an extrapolation right but um i'm looking for a very strong um motion toward preventing that right and and a strong commitment from the united states to prevent the creation of a new nuclear weapon state and and that simply is not coming um, the other thing I will say is that uh, this feeds into what we've seen in the past few years of uh, an argument that I think a lot of people uh, see as coming out of uh, Russia, but I think has come also very strongly from uh, certain and very empowered sections of the U.S. political class about the possibility and um, think and thinkability, right, as opposed to unthinkability of the use of a low yield so-called nuclear weapon. Um, from the point in the Trump administration when the U.S. was, uh, there was a big push for the U.S. to develop as another so-called yo- low-yield nuclear weapon. And the the power of these weapons is is comparable in some cases to those used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it's not exactly low-yield, you know, if used in a populated area. It's kind of, a, it's a, it's a, it's an absolute, you know, dis- disingenuous way to refer to a nuclear weapon. Um, but there's been this push of sort of saying that, like, you know, contrary to what has sort of been accepted and understood as as true at nuclear weapons, um, a single the use of a singular single nuclear nuclear weapon might not lead to a nuclear war. It could just be you know an isolated event, which is something that um, experts have you know almost unanimously said is an absolutely unrealistic way of thinking about nuclear weapons um, for many decades. So there's a way to have that this has been kind of normalized. And what what worries me again, when you look at uh, all these different parts of this picture is that it's, it's, uh, it's an acceptance of the endless existence of nuclear weapons, right, as sort of looking away from their actual consequences. And it's a, um, a way of integrating them more fully in this kind of short, you know, really short term, um, irresponsible kind of foreign policy thinking. This is none of this is to speak also of Israel's nuclear weapons, right, which has still been not officially acknowledged by the United States. Um, But there are, you know, about 100 of them in existence. Uh, So there's, again, a way where uh, this is all part of sort of the, the US trying to to um, play this, you know, play this kind of management role in a in a really complex uh, regional situation. Anyway, I think I've kind of gone all all over the map, so I'm going to stop there. But thank you so much. Thank you, Emma Claire, um, for your expertise on the subject matter. I I do want to take it back to 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 Palestine before we go to call to action. There was a statement um, and and a question from Stephen in the chat that I would love for both uh, Mitchell and and uh, Sister Hawaida to, to, to respond to. Um, the question is about Israel's security needs. Um, Stephen states that the root cause of the problem is a fear of annihilation in the sex of Israeli Jews and Jews throughout the world. Though Israel is much stronger than Palestine militarily, that does not erase the fear, especially when some Palestinians or other Arabs continue to speak threateningly about Israel and its right to exist, and they do commit, continue to commit um, violence acts against Israelis. These threatening words and actions continue to re-trigger and renew Jewish fears for their survival, even though the actual threat may be less, much uh, less significant. So I'll open it up to both you, uh, Mitchell and Hawaida, to, to address this, please. So um, I think there's a, there's a couple of points that we have to really uh, be clear about. So one thing is, and I think Stephen actually touched on this in this question. Um, for decades, the the American strategy has been, uh, and and most I think consistently articulated by uh, Dennis Ross over the years, that if we ma- give Israel more weapons, more security, more you know more arms, we pass laws in Congress that guarantees its qualitative military edge over the entire Arab world. Um, if we do that well, eventually that will allow Israel to 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 make peace. It's turned out that's not the case. Uh, in fact, it, it's been the opposite. Uh, the stronger Israel has got, the more it has tightened its grip on uh, on uh, it has tightened its op- occupation of Palestinian people and its denial of Palestinian rights. So, um, 
the the issue of fear is i mean the, the, this case is a bit different than other cases we could compare it to because we as jews um have a history of persecution that is a deep and ingrained part of our identity as jews um particularly those of us who come from european descent um so that is and that is something that is significant and part of being jewish but it doesn't change the fact that the fear that you're talking about here um, is the same fear that white people had in South Africa. It's the same fear that slave owners had uh, of of slave revolts. It is that same fear. Yes, it is a it, there's a difference because of the 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 nature of Jews as opposed to you know white Christian men, but it doesn't change that dynamic. It's still the same thing. And in the end, the the uh, the reality is that that fear. Um, does not entitle us to deprive other people of their rights. That is that that has not that does not change. So how do we get around that? How do we how do we confront that? Given that the people who are so afraid are also the powerful. I mean, this is we're talking about a regional hegemon. We're talking about a military power in the region that is unrivaled uh, and has the exclusive backing of the world's only superpower. So how do we how do we how do we deal with that? Well, as I said earlier, I, I think we deal with that by uh, in, by promoting a regime of equality, by promoting equal rights for Palestinians. That is the job. And yes, Israel's not going to do that. That does have to be pressed from the outside. You know, not at gunpoint. There are many, many ways to pressure Israel to do this. Um, and it can be done. It has to be done. It's not going to work to to create a situation where we're pandering to is to this fear and i get it believe me as a jew i get it very deeply where this fear comes from i understand it you know i grew up in 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 an environment that was so radically zionist that i met mayor kahana when i was a kid okay that that that's where i come from believe me i get it i know how the how folks are feeling it doesn't change the reality of how we have to approach this, and it doesn't change the cure. The cure is granting the Palestinians equal rights, and that and that's how we find out that, hey, guess what? Jews and Palestinians can live together. And when we think about that fear, we might also look at the many Israelis, and there's plenty of them, the many Israeli Jews who advocate just that. You can look at the, the people right now who are, you know, who are being forcefully silenced by the police because they're calling for a ceasefire, because they recognize exactly what Hawaii just said before. There is no military solution. The army is not going to eliminate Hamas. Hamas is an idea. You can't eliminate an idea with, with guns. Um, you eliminate that radical, that militancy, that that violence, that anger by by eliminating the cause of it. And the cause of it is the colonial project, the dispossession, and the elevation of Jewish rights over those of Palestinians in Israel Palestine. That's how we cure it. That's how we address the fear. And yes, Israel will have to be pushed into it, but once they are. They will find out, hey, we can actually do this. This is so much better than constantly living in fear that and and, and hanging on to our guns for dear life. I think that that was uh, perfect, Mitchell. And I, I do want to commend you and so many others who actually grew up in, in a Zionist household and in that environment and have done the work after to see the problems with Zionism and then become such fierce advocates um, for anti-Zionism and equality for all people. I just want, if I could add anything, it is just to say, yeah, the, the very real fear of, of annihilation that Mitchell talks about. I mean, it starts with the history of, of persecution in Europe, the Holocaust, but then what happened, right, is that Israel was established as a colonial state on a land that had a people and now expects the colonized people to live under perpetual subjugation and guarantee its security because of these fears when we had nothing to do with, with you know Jewish persecution. And in order to maintain that um, colony, and in order to maintain that um, what Israel has, is very clear about, that it's uh, Israel must be a Jewish state for the Jewish people, is not only um, 
the, the, the intense militariz militarization and subjugation of the colonized people, but this constant creation of, of a boogeyman, if you will. There's always a reason why it can't uh, negotiate or it, it has to uh, pursue certain policies. At first it was the PLO and Yasser Arafat, then it was Hamas, then it was... and. What we actually see, if you look at like one of the things Steve mentioned, is that there is this threat coming from some Palestinians and Arabs. It is very uh, minimal. It is m much less than what we hear from Zionists and settlers. And oftentimes it is in response to the severe repression. And if we actually look at what happened uh it, it, you know, Hamas that has been so vilified as, as they can't accept Israel and they will not live side by side. It's actually quite the opposite is Hamas and Israel allowed Hamas to operate, to continue to grow as long as, you know, Hamas had a charter that seemingly Israel could say, it can, it can kind of look at and, and vilify. But in 2004, Hamas's two top leaders actually accepted the idea of a long-term truce, aka a two-state solution uh, with Israel, and to, to sit and negotiate. And after that, they participated in elections. But it was at the moment that the two top leaders of Hamas accepted the idea of a two-state solution. They called it a long-term truce. Within months, Israel assassinated them both, both of them. Wherefore, you know, years prior, let them operate. But as soon as they start to talk about actually moving towards something, um, they they get wiped out. And that has been actually a pattern. So because Israel needs to create this constant boogeyman in order to refuse um, all kinds of pressure to negotiate for equality and, and a just solution. So uh, I just wanted to add those points to Mitchell's very pertinent and, and on point comments. Thank you wholeheartedly to you both for making this such an incredible, incredible event. Um, and to the rest of our speakers, um, who I will mention by name, I do want to bring Ryan Black in. I wish we had more time with all of you here, um, but perhaps this could be a phase one of of a of a two part uh, Zoom meeting where we when we come together again and engage in in, in dialogue. Uh, Ryan Black, are you still there, sir? Of course. All right, great. So let's talk about the call to action before we uh, thank our audience and, and uh, say goodbye. Sure. Yeah, I just posted a link in the chat. That is to a form. If you are interested in organizing during the next Diffuse Nuclear War week of action, January 8th through 14th of 2024, then fill out that form. Let us know. We will reach out, be in contact, and we will get the ball rolling. Uh, lots of options, all sorts of things you can do to organize, even if you're not interested in organizing an event yourself, but you're just interested in attending and showing up to something uh, and, and supporting other organizers on the ground, please fill out that form uh, and we will be in contact and it doesn't commit you to anything, but it lets us know you're at least interested. Um, and yeah, feel free to share the form with your friends, your colleagues, uh, people you organize with, the organizations you're part of, the, the groups you're in. And we appreciate all of you and all the speakers were fantastic. And it was a, a, a excellent evening uh, of education and hopefully we will have an excellent week of action here in January. Thank you so much, Ryan. I do wanna ask our speakers to please share their social media handles on uh, uh, in our chat for folks who want to follow uh, and continue following the work that you do. Um, that would be great. Um, I do want to, again, thank you wholeheartedly uh, for participating in, in this evening's uh, very engaging conversation. I want to thank our speakers, Mitchell uh, Plitnik, Hawaida Araf, my sister, um, Emma Claire Foley, Abdullah Al Auda, and uh, Ryan Black, my colleague, Norman Solomon, my mentor. Um, and um, hi, darling. I, she, Hawaida, what is your daughter's name? Mayar. Mayar, pleasure to meet you, Mayar, you beautiful thing. Again, we will send you all of the rec the recordings, the links that have been shared in the chat, and we hope that you do join us for the call to action in the month of January. Again, I thank you for being here and have a beautiful rest of the evening. Good night.